Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at finding roots of complex numbers. We've already dealt with powers, now let's go ahead and move to roots. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at a particular situation here, equation here, and let's just say that this is e to the fourth minus one is equal to zero. Now, if we were to go ahead and find all the roots or the zeros of this particular equation, we need to know exactly how many there are first. And let's just think about that. We know that there are four roots because this is going to be a degree four polynomial. And if any roots are complex, of course, they come in conjugate pairs. Now, fortunately for us, we can actually go ahead and factor this to z squared minus one and z squared plus one equals zero. We can further factor each one of these factors here to z plus one, z minus one, and z plus i, z minus i. And sure enough, we come up with four roots, two which are complex and of course conjugates of each other, as z is equal to plus or minus one, or z is equal to plus or minus i. Now that's going to be the Cartesian method of finding the roots, because all we're doing is we're factoring. Now, oftentimes, you're not going to be able to factor. And if you cannot factor it, how are we going to find the roots of complex numbers? Now, what we want to do is we want to use what is going to be the polar method. And what we need to do is we need to change everything into its polar form. So what we're going to do then is instead of having z to the fourth minus one is equal to zero, we're going to go ahead and say z to the fourth is equal to one. Now, why are we going to make that change? Well, because if we go ahead and assume that z is going to be equal to r cis theta, and one is going to be equal to one cis of zero degrees, now we can go ahead and take a look at two complex numbers in polar form being equal to each other. Now, if we go ahead and take a look at how this works out, we know that z is just going to be r cis theta raised to the fourth power is equal to one, which we said was expressed as one cis theta. Using the Mabier's theorem, we know that this is true. And now that we have two polar forms of complex numbers on each side of the equality, we need to make sure that the moduluses are the same, moduli are the same, as well as the arguments. So what I do then is I just say, well, the moduli have to be equal to each other, and the arguments have to be equal to each other. Now, the reason why we have the plus 360 degrees k here, where k is an element of z, is because we know that, we know that the cis is going to exhibit periodic behavior with the period being 360 k, where k is an element of z. So therefore, if I take the fourth root of both sides, I get this. If I divide by four, I get this for the arguments. And therefore, I know that whatever the solution is going to be, for this particular equation, its polar form has to assume one cis of 90 degrees k, again, where k is an element of z. Now, if I want to go ahead and find all of those values, well, I gotta just let k be equal particular integer values. I'll start off with zero, one, two, three. And so we know that the associated roots, complex roots, in polar form, is going to be cis theta, uh, cis zero degrees, cis 90 degrees, cis 180 degrees, and cis 270 degrees, which are one i, negative one, negative i in Cartesian form, respectively. So what we know then is that the polar form here is going to give us exactly the same consistent uh, solutions as we did with the Cartesian method. But of course, the advantage to this is that you don't have to, sometimes our initial equation will not be factorable. So if it is not factorable, then that's the road that we want to take. Now, one question is, is why didn't we take k is equal to four? Well, the reason why k is equal to four is not being considered is because then this would give us the cis of 360 degrees, which is exactly the same thing as k is equal to zero. Okay, so a lot of consistency here with some of the things that we've learned not only with regards to how many solutions we have, but also how we can go ahead and take a look at finding the solutions for a particular uh, complex equation or complex polynomial by using either the Cartesian method of factoring and when it's not factorable, using the polar method and changing things into its polar form. Okay, so the one thing that I would like to go ahead and end with though, is I'm hoping that everybody might be I'm hoping that people see, of course, a consistency and a pattern here. 
And I invite you to go ahead and think about how you would go about graphing those on the Argon diagram. There are going to be some nice patterns that are going to emerge. So we'll take a look at more examples when we see each other the next time in class. And until then, see you then. Bye-bye.